Oh, do you have the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith? Um, yes, sir. You do? Oh, okay, because I was going to send you one. If you want yeah, to. I mean, thank you. Tell me on paper. Yeah, on paper or the book form. I mean, it's... it's let, me, let me check and make sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. This is the book here. Either the book or I... Let me see. Um... Yeah, I got I got some copies. Okay. Right. And what was the name of it again? It's called the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay, I'll check it. Soon. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> if not, you know, John, I'll I'll send you. Okay. I'll send it to you, and you let me hear. Well, here's some copies. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because I got everything you gave me. Well, we're going to be in the, uh, the one, what, what we're going to be looking at is, uh, Okay. Let's get right over it, is it? We were looking at 21, chapter 21, when you get it, when you think, yeah, chapter 21. Well, that's on page, if you got the paper, it's on page 19. It's on page 19. Just hold on to it, and, and we'll, um, when we get to it, in our lesson, we'll, <coughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let you know where we're going to be at. All right? okay. And I just want everybody to have a copy, so... When we when we when we use that particular uh, notes there, we so we can you know. All right. Well, we, we thank the Lord. This is our Sunday school, adult Sunday school lesson, and our church school. How to worship God? How to worship God? Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for the blessedness of the Word of God. We pray, Lord, as our hearts and mind uh, uh, read and study the Word of God together that we may know the will of God and how we ought to worship you. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, to bring it up to uh, what we've been talking about, I, 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 I understand and I know that in some churches, in some way, it's, it's hard to reform. It's hard to reform um, a church, and it does take time. It does take time to reform. Reform, and, and what we mean by reform, we mean that you're you're doing a all-inclusive change uh, to bring about the church being guided by the word of God. The church being guided by the word of God. The preacher themselves must heed to the word and the word only as they study the scriptures, and as the spirit of God. Reveal through the scriptures the understanding, the wisdom of the scriptures, then the man of God, the teacher, is to bring it out before the people. And to some congregations, uh, it may take a longer time than others to grasp uh, what the scriptures is, is, is teaching. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know? okay? But what we're looking at is the, um, the method and the way in which we are to worship God. It's, I don't want to make it legalistic or a pattern or whatever, but God has not forsaken the way that he did in the Old Testament in order for us to get the people in the Old Testament to worship him. We worship God. There's a, there's a principle, as it was in the Old Testament. Let me, let me get slow down. As it was a principle a method of way of worshiping God and the only way you can approach God, so it is in the New Testament as we're looking. All right? And what the regular principle of worship stands for, as in the Old Testament, the same as the New, is that it holds to that we must worship God in the manner 
he has so commanded, and I'm not to write this, let me write this down. In the manner that he commands, and that command, I'm writing it here, is in his word. I know I'm squeezing it in here, but there it is. That, that manner in which God so commands us to worship him is brought out in his word. Right? It's not something that we just do because we spontaneous want to do something in, in, in our church worship. It has to be vindicated. It has to be approved by the word of God. So you see, because scripture is our ultimate authority, the word of God, the, the word of God, what we are bound, bound to, it is such binding in our hearts. And because it is the ultimate authority, it defines, the word, it defines, not only our theology, but our piety, our piety. What we believe about God and how we respond to Him. Worship, we got to get the congregation to worship God as He commands it. Now, in the Old Testament, which we, we left off in John chapter 4. You may want to turn there while I'm talking. In John, the Gospel of John chapter 4. We left off how that the Old Testament means of worship was by laws, ceremony, oaths, and sacrifices, and much more. They were outward shows. It were outward stuff that they had to do. Set up an altar, how to build an altar, the tabernacle, the, 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 the synagogue. All that was by means of the laws, the various laws, 600 and some laws stated in the Old Testament that God gave to the people through Moses the prophets, okay? They, they consist of various laws, various ceremonies, various feast days, holy days, oaths, and sacrifices. That was the Old Testament. In the Bible, and I told you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, you see that the way of worshiping God during the New Testament, New Covenant, is in spirit and in truth. And this is where we left off in, and we want to deal with that. Remember last week we talked about, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, let me know. The woman um, was, was, was telling Jesus how they worship in the mountains as Samarians. Now, let me take about, let's say, about 20 minutes, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and deal with how uh, worship was essential in the Old Testament and what they did in the Old Testament in their worship. Let me let me let me bring out. First, we move into the uh, time in which Cain, <clears throat> Cain and Abel, their point of worship, they brought to God what their expectation of what God wanted in the worship. Abel brought the best of his flock and offered on the altar. Both of the boys built an altar. They was instructed by their father, Adam. God told Adam, Adam told the boys. Adam, you know, Cain and Abel. Abel brought a flock, the best of his flock, killed it, and laid it on the altar. God accepted that. Cain, on the other hand, brought what he wanted to the altar and put it on the altar. God didn't accept that. And, and Cain got angry, you know, not only with God, but his anger is called pent anger. It's when you, you're angry at someone, but you take it out on somebody else. 
you know, and so that's what Cain did. Instead of reaching out to God and, and physically or whatever, he couldn't do that, so he took it out on, on, on Abel, uh, and he killed his brother Abel. As we move on down the scriptures through the Old Testament, the children of Israel began to be uh, worship God. They left the worship of God, the direct commandments of God, how to worship Him. And wanted to do what they wanted to do. Even with Aaron's two sons in Leviticus chapter 10 attempted to do that, and God destroyed them, the, both the two sons of Aaron. Of course, the children of Israel, they wanted to um, worship God in their own manner with the golden calf. Do you remember reading that? Okay. Then, so what God did was within the realm of the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments, it tells us chiefly what God's expectation of how we need to worship Him. The first commandment of the Ten Commandments reminds us that the Lord is the only proper recipient to be worshipped. No one is allowed to worship any one, any person, other than God. You see, in many forms of religion and denomination, in the realm of Christianity, there are those who worship a woman, a statue, and different things like that. That is prohibited. It is not allowed. So the first commandment reminds us that the Lord is the only proper recipient of our worship. The command prohibits the worship of false gods and enjoins us to worship only the true God, the Lord. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus 20, verse 2 and 3. That's the first commandment. I am the Lord your God, you shall not have any other God. So, number one, we are to worship the one and only true God, our Creator. That's the responsibility of all the creatures of God, mainly humans, to worship the one true God. And that's the expectation and the responsibility that is upon mankind. This is the law that God revealed to Moses to give to the children of Israel. The second commandment continues the focus of worship. This is Exodus chapter 20. If you want to turn to it, you can, or you can follow, listen to what it said. The second commandment continues the focus on worship by telling us how God is to be worshipped. Now, the first commandment says, who should be worshipped. The second commandment says how to worship God. How God is to be worshipped. It does it so in a negative sense by forbidding us to worship God with human inventions. Thou shalt not make unto you any graven image. Exodus 20 and 4. A graven image is not merely a statue of false deity. If that was the case, the second commandment would be redundant of the first. Instead, the second commandment plainly forbids making or reverend physical or artistic representation of the true God. I'm going to repeat that. Right. Now remember, the first commandment says, Thou shalt worship the Lord. I am the Lord. You shall worship me only. The second commandment says, Thou shalt not make any graven image. Now, what we have in our human expectation feel that we're saying that that means don't make a statue or idol. That's not what is 
alluring to, even though it's part of it, but that's not what it's alluring to. A graven image is not merely a statue of false deity. The point matter is that God says, when you worship me, the only true God, number one, first commandment, it says in number two, you shall not make unto you any graving image. It forbids. God do not want us, the one true God, he says, I'm the one to worship. This is how it's done. Do not make anything or reverence, any physical art, method, or form of worshiping me. See, that's what it means in the second commandment. It does involve bowing down to a statue, to a person, to a picture, to a cross. Because that is signifying that you are worshiping that as a God. So when any man or woman, whether it's Mary or your pastor or a prophet or a person, is bound, when you bow down to them, you reverence them. That is prohibited. That's wrong. You're not to do that. You're not to show homage, reverence to that individual, to that artist, artist, artist or its representation because it, you're formulating in your mind, in your heart that that picture, that cross, that person is God. When the first commandment says, I am the Lord your God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. By, see, what, what, is, what, is, what, is, what has happened in the uh, mid-century, I'm trying to categorize this, from A.D. 315 up until A.D. what 1600, there was the known teaching at that time dominated, the world dominated by a one religion because there was no other well, there were other religions. There was religions in China because China had their dynasty. In India, they had their dynasty and their religion. In Africa, they had their religion and dynasty. And then therefore, the, the truth of the one true God was only given to Israel. And it was passed on to the Gentiles because the Gentiles came into the church as the church grew. But what took hold was the dominancy of the Roman Empire made it so that the gods were treated as gods and you worship the gods but when mythology fell away and broke away the religion of the early church fell into the hands of the romans which made keyed in on jesus mother who is mary Okay, and other aspects like John the Baptist and prominent men of the early New Testament, and they began to worship them and bow down to them, mainly so Mary, Holy Mary, Mother of God, blessed is the fruit of your womb, as the rosary and many other sayings. And, and so the dominancy of the Roman Catholic Church is Rome from AD 30. 300 and something up until the time of the Reformation, which is A.D. 1500, A.D. 1600, give or take a few centuries. There were no other uh, Christian religion. There were other religions facing mankind, all right? but there wasn't no Christianity at that point until it was focused on Roman Catholicism. Religion was dominancy in the time of Nimrod, uh, Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 11. That's when the earth began to be really populated after the flood by uh, 
Noah's three sons, and it began to be populated, and so there came a thought, let us build a, 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 a tower, let's build a tower so we won't be destroyed by water anymore, so we can honor our God, our form of God in religion. That's Genesis chapter 11. They wasn't trying to build something towards heaven to where God at. They were just building their act of, 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 of system of religion, which was dominated by Nimrod and his mother, his, um, um, his mother wife. And that was astrocity, but that's what's back in Genesis. But here, here as we come to in, 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 in as we go through the Old Testament, we found out that the children of Israel, which had the dominancy of the true God, and it was shared to them only. But what had happened was that the children of Israel provoked the Lord and began to marry outside of the children of Israel. I think I gave this information in our last but I don't want to dwell on it too much. But the Samaritans were a group of people that felt uh, that, the, that the Jewish people had contact with the Amorites and Canaanites and other tribes and nations and brought about this um, Samaritan group of people. What I wanted to focus on before I, we go to Jesus saying in John chapter 4, verse 20 something, 23, 24 was that one act of, there were many kings of Israel that walked away from God. What two of the kings were Ahab, who married Jezebel. He was the most profound, wicked one, king of Israel. Then there was another one named, I want to key in on in 1 Kings chapter 11. His name was Jeroboam. Um, he received a prophecy and he became king of the ten tribes of Israel, the northern tribe. What had happened, I'm not going to read all of it, it's found in 1 Kings chapter 11, 12, and 13 if you want to read it. What had happened was when he became king <clears throat> of Israel, governing the ten tribes while there was another king of uh, Judah governing two tribes, 10 and 2, 12. This particular king did not want the children of Israel to go down, because it was customary to go down to Jerusalem to worship the Lord on a set day, on a set month in Judah. To keep them from going down there to do that, he set up <coughs> in, <coughs> excuse me, in Bethel and in the tribe of Jude and Dan, the Bethel and Dan, what he did was he set up a false system of worship for the children of Israel within the ten tribes. He set up a false worship, a false idol in each location north of the northern kingdom, south of the northern kingdom, Dan and Bethel. Because he did not want the people of Israel to go down to Judah, where Jerusalem was at, because that's the place where you worship historically Jehovah God on a particular day, the 14th day. You did the feast day and all the rest of it. So what Jeroboam did was he set up these two areas within the northern kingdom and he changed the days also to the 13th day. This is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 11, 12, and 13. You read it. Very interesting. He sang so against Israel. Not only him, but other kings did also. He was one of the worst, as well as um, it spiraled down to Ahab, the son of Omari. Um, he did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that went before him. And it came to pass that it's been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jehoiakim, son of Nebat, that he took 
to wife Jezebel, the daughter of East by Baal, king of the Zizonians, and they went and served Baal and worship him. And um, as it reads on, he just he turned the heart of Israel against God, the true God. So that brings us to the reading how that the Samaritan woman says, we worship in the mountains and we do this and we do that. Jesus responded and said, woman, you don't know who you worship. You know, God gave um, worship to the Jewish people. And then Jesus responds further by saying, uh, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither in that mountain nor at Jerusalem. So, so, so you see, there was two set places dominated by, by whether you were half Jew and half Samaritan, which was in the mountains, or whether you were true blood Jews, worship Jehovah in Jerusalem. There coming a time in which the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now that's where we left off last time. So let's let's proceed with that. In the Old Testament, the means of worship was by the Jewish people <clears throat> was given the law. And when we say the law, it meant six hundred and some laws which included the Ten Commandments. That was the ceremony laws, the sacrificial laws, the judicial laws, and the Ten Commandments. All four of those bring about six hundred and some laws. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he abolished those laws of ceremony, oaths, and sacrifices, but not the Ten Commandments. Because Paul still uses the Ten Commandments in his preaching and teaching in the epistles, as well as the other authors of the New Testament. So when Jesus says, neither in Jerusalem nor in the mountains, because God is a spirit, and they that worship God must worship God in spirit and truth. He said this twice. Verse 23, let me reiterate again. In verse 23 of John chapter 4, turn your Bibles to John chapter 4, verse 23. It says, yet a time is coming, and now is come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. Verse 24. God is a spirit. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now I know in the King James as well as in my NIV Bible here. Uh, uh, the word spirit is at the end of verse 24. You see that. The word spirit is capitalized. It's, 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 it can be capitalized, but then it can't be. But let's get some understanding what it says. By means of only spirit and truth. What does it mean that Jesus says that beginning, he's beginning the new covenant, a new way of worshiping, not of the old law, ceremony, oaths, and sacrifices, we don't worship that manner, structure, outside structure, form. But we need to worship God in spirit, right? in spirit and in truth. Let's deal with that, how we need to worship God. Now, I know, as I said earlier, that it is very hard to cause a church to think about worshiping God in spirit and truth because many have a, a misunderstanding of what it means spirit and truth and this is why you have the shouting wilding on the floor the speaking in tongues because all that is categorized under the flag, under the word spirit you know leave them alone they're shouting leave them alone they're they're, they're in the spirit they're drunk and, and so they they categorize misunderstanding of the word God is a spirit and they that worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. So you see that is 
being done in many forms, in many ways, uh, what it says of, of spirit, of spirit. And they think that's what it means. But they, they fail to understand the word flesh. It says God is a spirit, and they that worship God must worship him in spirit. Truth. So what we have to identify is what is spirit and what is truth as related to what Jesus is saying. So we got to get away from our uh, traditions and man-made uh, representation and traditions and sayings and follow what Jesus says in, in, the, in the blessed scriptures and, and what he says. Now, let me make note of what, what I just said, tradition, because in Matthews, chapter 15 of Matthews, yeah, Jesus confronted the, the Pharisees because the Pharisees and the elders has long time adapted the people in a formula of how to worship God. They have built up strongly a tradition within their uh, the temple in the minds of the people. And I say that because it's the same thing happened today. And that's why I said in the beginning how I know, like John Calvin said in Reforming the Church, how it was very difficult for the church to move away from tradition and the way things are set up in the church and, 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 and get the church, the people, to worship God in spirit and in truth because of all the, the traditions and stuff that is so elaborated in the church. It's so hard for a church to say, you know what? Um, we're not supposed to be doing it this way. We're not supposed to be, you know, acting out this way. And see, when you go that way, people are saying, oh, you're wrong, you're, you're demon-possessed, you're not right, you're, you, 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 you're, you're forgetting what scriptures are saying, but in reality, they are not following the scriptures. So, who is right? The scriptures, of course, is right. Not man, not me, not the church, not the denominator. The, the scriptures are right, of course, okay? But Jesus confronted the Pharisees, the scribes, and the elders, in Matthew chapter 15, if you want to get there, follow me, please. That's Matthew chapter 15, starting at verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples, those that's following you, that's what the word disciple means. Transgress the tradition of the elders. See, the, the, the elders, the Pharisees, the scribes, before Jesus came on the scene, the children of Israel were doing some horrible things, but they didn't know it was horrible. They, they, they was following the guidelines of the elders. It's just like in church. You're only doing because the preacher said it or because everybody else is doing it. You know, you, you, you start off giving 10% because everybody else was doing it and you don't want to look embarrassed or bad, so you're going to get 10%. So, I mean, you see somebody else shouting or dancing and this and that and waving their hands and saying hallelujah. So you say, well, that, in your mind, that's a form of gratitude of praising God, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to raise my hand and shout all over the place. So that's, that's the same mythology that the, the elders were doing, and they geared the minds of the, of the Israelites, the Jews, in their day. So when the, when, when the followers of Jesus were not doing what they had set up <clears throat> as the pattern to do in the temple, the pattern to do in the, temp, in, in the synagogue, they approached Jesus and said, wait a minute, Lord, your disciples are transgressing the traditions of the elders. The elders have set the pattern. They have set the way in which you come into the temple, into the synagogue, 
in and in, in worshiping God. That's the set pattern. Don't don't go outside of it. Because if you do, you're sinning. And so in the day in the church today, that's why those in charismatic, different denominations, Pentecostal, Apostolic, and whatever, some Baptist and whatever church, if you don't do what they do, then you're wrong. Because they feel they have the set pattern. That they're doing it right. They don't know that they got it from their ancestors, which ancestor and, and, and it came from it, it just followed. So who who sets the pattern? Who sets the goal, the objectives, the mark, and how we need to worship God? This is it's precisely what Jesus is saying in John chapter 4. It is the scriptures. It is the scriptures is our ultimate authority. Not movement, not emotions, not brain waves, not heartfelt. Because heartfelt brain intelligence, books and commentary can be error. There can be error even in the creeds, catechisms, and confessions. Yes, it can because they're not they're not infallible. No, none of the confessions, none of the catechisms, none of the creeds are infallible. They are man made, drawn from scriptures, but they can still be wrong. Because it's drawn from scriptures, it still be uh, documented that the person that writes it or the group that brought it together, because they are fallible, they still can make mistakes. But the scriptures, there are no scriptures in the original scriptures, the word of God, penned down by Paul, the writers of the New Testament, the writers of the Old Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Catechisms, confessions, and creed are not inspired by God. We use, we may use them only to the point that it is verified by the word of God. Within the confessions, within the catechism, and the creeds, if any word or clause or statement is written and said and it doesn't agree, you shouldn't go along with it just because the, the Father is the divine or the, because it is the Belgic or because it's the Heidelberg Catechism or because certain uh, fathers of the past written it and they were astounding uh, scholars of the scriptures. Scholars still make mistakes. They are fallible. But the point is that the Holy Spirit of God so guided the prophets of old and the New Testament writers so mightily, the Spirit of God kept them, that's the authors of the scriptures, they kept them from writing error. Even though Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Moses, Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the rest of Peter were men fallible. The Holy Spirit, when he moved upon them, he kept them from writing error. Translations, commentaries, books, they are fallible. They have words, confessions, catechism, and whatever that could have a statement or a word that is not really what Paul or Moses or what is saying. So therefore it takes the scripture reading with the guidance of the Spirit of God to see what it means by spirit in spirit in truth. You follow me? We just can't take it for granted in a commentary in Webster's Dictionary or in a catechism, or in a creed, because it's so state that the spirit is this. We got to see what the scripture says, because the creed may be wrong, but the scriptures are never wrong. So we got to say, God is a spirit. God is spirit. And they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in 
truth. So we got to we got to ascertain. We got to understand what it means when we come to worship God in spirit and in truth. Because in the Old Testament, they didn't worship God in spirit and in truth. They worship God by means of laws, ceremony, oaths, and sacrifices, and many other things, which was only a shadow of the things to come through Jesus Christ. And therefore, through Jesus Christ, who says you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God, when you are thus so, you are enabled to worship God in spirit and in truth. Right. In spirit and in truth. So, Jesus responded back to those the Pharisees and elders by saying, Why do you transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? Tradition, see? God says, Why do you transgress the commandments of God versus your traditions? Are you putting your traditions on an equal level with God's commandments? And that's what we, the church, are doing. We have elevated the sayings of man, no matter how good they are. And, and we have some prominent men and, and ministries that are, but we, we elevate people and makes them giants. We make ministries spectacular, marvelous, commentary, books. We say a certain preacher is magnificent. Oh, I will follow his men. But you see, we have taken that and, and, and lined it up with the word of God. And we are not to. We're guilty of that. No matter how good and inspiring a man in his preaching and his ministry is, he is still subject to fail. He is still subject to sin. Not willfully, but he because he's still in a cursed body. You and I, as elders, as ministers, we're not perfect. We strive, we grow in grace, but we're not perfect. If, when I attempt, if I attempt to write a commentary or a lesson or a book or songs or, or, or write a, a worship song, it is quite possible that I can slip some of my, my understanding into what I feel what the scriptures is saying. That's because I'm fallible. So we search the scriptures. Not footnotes, not commentaries, not books, tracts, and whatever, but we search the scriptures. That's what Paul said. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say search, search the uh, Septuagint or search you know, the old sayings of the elders or search the lost books and search the lost tribes or search no he didn't he says search the scriptures as Paul says the scriptures but we are in what 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 it happened is we're in a habit we have we're so in a habit that we can't preach or teach without the understanding of a commentary a dictionary or a book and this is wrong it may be some good things in those books and commentaries which I do have. But the scriptures is our ultimate authority. Because those are not infallible or inspired. So when Jesus says God is a spirit and they that worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. It's not that when we come to church, we get into a mode, we build ourselves up into a frenzy and mentally or a psychological mode to come to worship God. The scripture says, God is spirit, and they that worship God 
must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what is spirit and in truth? Spirit is what that which is governed by the Holy Spirit of God. That which is governed by the Holy Spirit of God. He leads us. And he does not do anything contrary and confusing within worship. The truth, spirit, truth, the truth is God's word. What is revealed in his word, spirit and truth. And this is the reason why we must have first a priority of the mode of which God is duly worshipped. Without that, the gospel cannot be presented accurately and people cannot approach God in a duly bound way in which it will be gratifying to God, will be pleasing to God as they come to worship Him. I know it's, it is difficult to persuade the church the world, the people, that God disapproves of all such modes of, 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 of worship. He said, it must be sanctioned by spirit and truth. And each time we come to church, on a given day, that day, the Lord's day, to worship, and wherever you may gather, wherever you may gather together, and and we assemble together on the Lord's day, wherever geographically you meet, under whatever condition, we are to realize. For, for, for our most that we are seated in heavenly places when we do come. Ephesians 2 and 6. When we worship God in spirit and truth, we do come to Mount Zion, S-I-O-N, to the city of the living God, which is the, the church. And we'll deal more with that in our morning message. Revelations. This is the reason why we went to uh, the scriptures last week. As you turn, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter um, uh, 14. See, when, like, like I, I have to repeat myself, I know it's hard to uh, get ourselves into the, the mode of true worship because of all, everything that's happening, the programs, and everything that's going on in a worship service on Sunday morning. If we can only just sit back and sit and look at all what is going on in a church service and say, wow, is that necessary? Is that pleasing to God? Is that all that is done, transpire in that hour, two, or three, or whatever? Is it spirit? Is it truth? You got to wonder now. Now, Paul to the Corinthians, the, the Corinthians, they really got gung ho. If I want to use that, that descriptive word there, they were gung ho for serving God, as many Christians are. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's the mode, it's the method, spirit and truth. Make sure. So Paul tells the Corinthians, you know, you were Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols. To give you an understanding of what Paul was talking about, I have to use a update illustration. You 
have in certain countries, many some countries practice voodoo. You have certain countries that practice mysticism, curious arts, magic. You have certain countries that are involved with um, certain sensuous, emotional music. These Corinthians patterned themselves after the worship of the gods before they came to Christ. And they would do certain things, act certain way, carry out whatever they did in their acts of worshiping the gods. As in voodoo ceremonies, witchcraft, and different different worship religious activities in India, China, Jamaica, Haiti, and South America, even, even in the Americas and Africa also in Europe, in Russia, all over the world. So what had happened was, is that as he expressed to the Corinthians, you were pagans. You didn't know the true God. You was influenced and you was led astray by mute, mute idols that could not speak to you. Gods you could not even see or have a relationship with. Paul says, I want you to know that Jesus is Lord and no one can say that Jesus is Lord, is God, is Savior, except by the Holy Spirit of God. So he, 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 he tells them by way in 1 Corinthians 14, I told you to tell and turn there. The Corinthians were high strung in dealing with certain gifts in the church. They were high strung with the gift of, in worshiping God, they were high strung in the gift of tongues, languages, and miracles and wonders and sign gifts. They were not interested in prophecy, preaching, and teaching proper worship. First Corinthians 14. So Paul dealt with with a certain word that he used and expressed over 20 some six times over 26 times and that's the word speak because in worship in worship God speaks let me let me let me okay let me write it over here in worship uh, write this down. In worship, we come together to worship God. In, within worship, God. I'm going slow because I want this to penetrate. God speaks. He speaks to us by means only by the word which the preach word and then the sacraments that's how God when we come together to worship God, He speaks to us by means only by the Word. I want you to have that penetrating in your mind. And know for sure that all the other stuff that's going on in churches from 11 in US, I'm talking USA time, 
from 11 to 11, 12 or 1 o'clock, 2 or whatever. Is it these two things going on? Because they also is consistent within Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 32. And I'm going to get that to make sure that, that that scripture is right also. All right. All right, here it is. Right, I said 32, it should be 42. Yeah, it's 42, not 32. The church continued, see, after thousands of people came to know Christ as Savior, the church was growing. The scripture says, and they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking bread and prayer. See, all that is consistent of that. Because in preaching the word, you have to, there's prayer. The sacraments is the Lord's Supper and baptism, water baptism. In Acts 4.32, when they came to, see, that's the set pattern. The pattern that should be set in spirit and in truth. They came together. They were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Why the apostles' doctrine? Why not Jesus' doctrine? Because Luke knew that what the apostles taught came from Jesus. He set the pattern because the apostles, the Holy Spirit is very diligent in this. He knew that the apostles, some of them, was going to write letters. So the stage was set that Jesus preached the gospel. Jesus preached doctrine. He preached expository doctrine. That's his method of preaching. It was expository. That method of preaching, both the gospel and expository preaching, he gave it to the apostles, the twelve. When Paul came on the scene, Jesus personally taught him for two and a half years in the desert, Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 2, and Paul said, yeah, I spent time, I was called by Jesus. So both the, both the twelve and the apostle Paul, seen Jesus, taught by Jesus, grounded by Jesus, and the sayings that Jesus said throughout his time here on earth, he gave it to his apostles. When he threw Saul off the horse in Acts chapter 9 and made him an apostle to the Gentile. He took him for two and a half years or so and grounded him in what he told the twelve. So all the apostles saw Jesus, taught by Jesus. So that's why the, that's why there's no apostles because you have to have been seen Jesus, taught by Jesus personally, not by spirit flesh. So he speaks to us by means only by the word. In worship, we, God here, we speak to God by means of prayer and worship. So there you have it right there. In worship, God speaks to us by means only by the word. Not visions, not prophecies, not dreams, not 
chanting, not tongues. God speaks to us by the word, the preached word. And the reason the sacraments, that he, because the sacraments points to the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, which is the Lord's Supper and water baptism. The Lord's Supper, which is breaking bread and water baptism. In turn, in worship, when we're gathered on that particular day, the Lord's Day, we speak back to God by prayer in our worship. So, if only churches will take time to study 1 Corinthians 14, when Paul kept saying, speak, 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 and he does it 20 some times. It's recorded. You know, I mean, it's amazing. But we don't, we don't take the time because we are a zealous people that we want instant gratification, sensuous gratification, emotional gratification, sight and sound. Instead of spirit and truth. So the word speak is, is brought out continuously. So Paul says, if, if you're following me, so Paul says, he says, how is it then, brethren, verse 26, when you come together, so that, you know, to worship God. So when you come together, we come to what? Worship God. How is it that when you come together, Every one of you has a psalm, have a doctrine, have a tongue, have a revelation, have an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Edifying means to equip. So that's the whole point of that jamboree that that what we call a monkey pole, a monkey bar in the, uh, in the, in the school yard, and they, they were hanging on the bar, they're flipping over, and they, they're exercising each part of their muscles and their tension. They're, they're strengthening their bones. Everything must be done to, for edifying, building up. And that's the reason why Paul allures to, again, to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, he had given us apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers, and evangelists for the perfecting, for the edifying of the church. The gifted men were given for the church for this sole reason, to edify, to build up, to mature the saints, the church, until Christ comes back. Then he says, he picks up again, once again in verse 27, he says, if any man speak in a tongue, in a language, let it be done by most, by three, and that by the course, and let one interpret. Of course, you know, when you see this in churches today, they have no interpreter. It's the phrase, leave her alone, leave her alone. They're speaking in mystery, no man understands them. It's a brilliant. How is it that, that meaning when the scripture says, when they do speak in a language, make sure there's an interpreter? Okay. If there be no interpreter, let them keep silent in the church. Don't don't talk Ugani or Ghani. Don't speak in the tongue of French or African of any right sorts. If you're in the church, don't speak you know English if you're in a you know Mexican church. I I, I can't go to a church where it is Spanish people and we're fellowshipping and I start standing up and just speaking English. 
I can't do that. This is what Paul is saying. Because I, as an English person, do not have understanding of Spanish language. Because if I speak, I'm speaking as a barbarian. Because the majority of the people in the congregation don't even know what I'm talking about. And the reason is because they need an interpreter. If there is no interpreter when I go to their church, then I have to keep silent. This is the reason why when, when preachers go to another church or another country, they have an interpreter standing there saying, for God so loved the world, an interpreter interprets that in that language to the audience. Because the audience don't understand my English. If there be no interpreter, let them keep silent. So he keeps, he's using now two words. He says, speak if there's nothing, keep silent. If there's no interpreter, keep silent. So speak, silence, speak, silence. He says, when you do speak, verse 29, let it be two or three. And the others just sit back and judge. If something is revealed to another, see, in an early church, they the Spirit of God moved upon a prophet because they had the supernatural ability to receive the Word of God divinely from God. They did not have the scriptures in the early church, so the Spirit of God had to move mightily upon the preachers then. So if I was speaking, and another brother will say, Brother Sherman, the Lord wants me to say something. This is in the early church, not today. And I would step aside and say, okay, brother, say on. What, what is he saying? The other brother would get up and say, thus says the word. Jesus says, be a comfort, be a, you know, trust in him. If you're going through trials and tribulations, that was done. In her, but you see, that stuff is being done right now in churches, which it should not be because we got the scriptures. A man or a woman cannot stand up and prophesy and give a wild predicament. The Lord tell me, let's build, let's do this, let's go over here, let's get together, let's worship God. Let's, you can't do that. Out of, your, out of your bloom, they're just saying this, certain sayings. You can't do that. In the early church, they did it because they did not have the 66 books. Some of them didn't even have the Old Testament scriptures. And that's why Paul says, whether there be prophecies, they shall vanish away. And they did. The, the, the supernatural ability to prophesy or to preach, governed by the Spirit of God, instantaneously upon you, is gone. We preach the word. Scriptures. The written scriptures. That's why Paul says love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall cease. Whether there be tongues, they shall be stilled. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when the scriptures is come, the full scriptures is come, is complete, then we speak what the scripture says. Because God is not the author of confusion. Verse 33. Then Paul says, let the women, what? Keep silent. See, earlier he just said, if there's no interpreter, keep silent. Now he says, women keep silent in the church. The same word, silent, there in verse 28. If there be no interpreter, keep silent. In the church. We're talking about coming together. I'm not, I'm not talking about meeting in an in a, in a, in a, in a institute, in a, in a club, or here, or there, or what you say. When you come together, how is it that when you come together, come together to worship God, when that set day, that day, the day of the Lord, to worship God, a woman is not to speak. She's to keep silent. 
Women can become good theologians and, 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 and students in the scriptures and get their degree and study the word of God and there's nothing wrong with that. They should study the word of God. There's nothing wrong with women reading the scriptures, reading books and everything, going to get their degree or whatever level they want. But it says when you come together and worship God, when you come together in the, in the, in the confrontment of the families when we come together to worship God, the, the line is drawn, you cannot speak. No matter how knowledgeable you are in the word of God, how the Lord taps you on the back and say, I want you to preach, the scripture says, no, you didn't do that. Your pastor may push you into doing it, the scripture says, no, he didn't, he shouldn't be doing that. What are your qualifications? Because in Timothy and Titus, there's the only qualifications are there. Nothing said about a woman, but a man. So the word speaks continue on as we close out in verse 38. But if any man be consistently ignorant in this area, Paul says, let him be ignorant. Ignorance can cause harm in the church and the church will not grow. Churches are growing superficially. And what I mean by that is they're not really growing. They're, 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 they're cited on emotions, growth, numbers of growth, and people doing things, and the ministry is expanding, and, and they're getting money in the church financially, they're being successful, um, uh, things are happening, and that's not edification, that is not growth in the sight of God. Your church may not, if, if you're in a certain part of a city, county, or district, or a country, your church may not even grow for two or three years, and you may not even have a building. That doesn't mean that God is not with you. Brothers, if you're preaching the word of God and it's just your family for a year or two or whatever, stay true to God. Whether you're doing it in your home or apartment in the woods in the center on the top of the, the, the school in the school cafeteria, whether the, 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 the city council says, well, you can use a room in the city hall building and, or you can use the recreation, you, you preach the word. Do not be in dis in discouraged. I say to you, as I say to anyone, your ability to preach the word of God is governed by the spirit of God. And you are more, more blessed and well used as though you are a John MacArthur, Steve Lawson, Alistair Begg, Woody Von Char and any of these ministries, any of these preachers. You are on the same level with them. Now, I agree, many of them know more than what you do educationally, intellectually in the scriptures, but at the same level, we are one. Whether you, you are called by God and you are preaching the truth of God's word, do not be succumbed that you are lesser than a minister who is dominating the scene today. No, no, yes. No, you are one with them in the sight of God because the same spirit in you is preaching the word of God through the word of God by the power of the spirit as though you've been in a ministry for 20 or 80 years. God is a spirit. And they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. As I close, let me read from the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, chapter 21. Number one, the light of nature shows that there is a God. Let me, I, I've written it here. Let me put it up here so you can read what I read. The light of scripture shows that there is a God who has lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and does good unto all. 
and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted, in and served with all the heart, all our being, all our might. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations, devices of men, or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. Religious worship is to be given to God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to Him alone, not to angels, saints, or any other creature, nor in the mediation of any other but of Christ alone. So if you're worshiping, any other person bowing down and showing reverence to a cross, to a picture, to a sign, to a wonder, even to the very day Sunday, you're breaking the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments. You're not truly worshiping God. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. When we get back, come back next week, we're going to further develop on worship. And we're going to look at the prime interest of the regular principle of worship. Father, we thank you for the scriptures. It takes the sound teaching of the word of God. Instilled in the hearts of the mind and the people by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring about true worship. It is a gradual thing that it needs to be persistent and consistent. Help us, O oh Lord, to turn aside from the traditions of the elders, the traditions of the church, of the board, and follow the the authoritative scriptures, the word of God. If we are troubled by it, if we are angry by it, we need to release ourselves from such anger and release from such anger and frustration and know that the word of God alone is true. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless. We're going to start our worship service about quarter of. So we'll, uh, we'll contact everybody, you that are following, you that are here, that we will reassemble again at uh, 11.45. All right? Okay. Okay, God bless. And thank you for listening to you on YouTube and Facebook once again for worshiping God. How to worship.